reading this morning comes to us from the gospel according to Luke, chapter 23, beginning at verse 33. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by, watching, but the leader scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the, one of the criminals who was hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? We indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The word of the Lord. Do you know what I am thankful for? I am thankful for sweeping views from the tops of high mountains. The higher, the better. I am thankful for window seats on airplanes for much the same reason. For when you are high above the world, it is easy to be moved by the grandeur of creation without getting lost in all the obstacles that divide us on the ground. I'm thankful for the view from above because if you are high enough, even the bleakest sight on earth can look majestic. In truth, I love the mountaintop view of most of life over the view from the ground. Well, take families, for instance. If you want the mountaintop view of family life, just go to about any wedding and listen to the words of the minister and the vows that the couple makes. Or go to an infant baptism and listen to the promises made by parents and a church to raise a child together. In such rites of passage, we indeed share stirring visions of life from on high. Such visions represent our deepest hopes and our highest aspirations for our family and for our children. And yet, we don't, or most of us don't, live on high mountaintops. None of us live in airplanes. We live down on the ground, and as soon as the marriage vows are exchanged and the promises of baptism are affirmed, sometimes before, that plane lands, or sometimes crashes, and leaves us to struggle to find our way over the many obstacles on the ground. Give me the mountaintop view anytime. And for this reason, you can imagine how I have had to struggle with today's gospel reading. For again, you have to understand, as Carla was explaining to the children, this is Christ the King Sunday. This is the last Sunday in the church calendar year before we begin a new church year next Sunday with the start of Advent. Yes, it's just next week. And on Christ the King Sunday, we proclaim the full revelation of God in Jesus Christ and lift up scripture readings that reveal the true glory of the kingship of Christ. Yet where does our gospel lesson lead us today? To the high mountaintop of Christ's transfiguration? 
to the resurrection of Christ from the grave, to the ascension of the risen Christ to take his seat at the right hand of God? No. No, we are not taking up any high mountain at all. We're not given a sweeping vista from a high vantage point above the valley. Instead, we are taken down into it. Down into the valley of the shadow of death. And we are asked to affirm the kingship of Christ at his crucifixion. What do we make of this scripture lesson on this Sunday? At first glance, lifting up the crucifixion of Christ as the model of Christ's kingship is like foregoing the Apostle Paul's words about love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 at a wedding. And instead, reading the biblical, biblical account of King David and Bathsheba. Of course, weddings are not about bringing people down to earth but about trying to lift us all up with a vision of our aspirations for marriage. So why is the rejection of Christ by his own people, the abandonment of Christ by his own disciples, and the crucifixion of Christ with criminals, the centerpiece of Christ the King Sunday? Why wrestle with this passage when we could lift up a vision of our highest aspirations to honor Christ as our king. Why? Because it is here that the true nature of Christ's kingship is revealed. It is here that we see the power of sin broken in the world, and it is here that we have our and find our highest aspirations of this life made apparent and accessible to all who have faith in Jesus Christ. First of all, we go down to Christ's crucifixion to see the true nature of his kingship, the true nature of God's power revealed. Remember, Christ said that he was a king who came not to be served, but to serve God. He did not come to punish us for our sins, but to seek out the lost in order to save them. The nature of the kingship of Christ is not that of a conqueror who comes with armies of angels to force us to obey God. Instead, the nature of the kingship of Christ is a shepherd who is willing to lay down his life for his sheep in order to free us to willingly follow. Second, in addition to seeing the true nature of Christ's kingship in his crucifixion, we also see the power of sin, indeed the power of evil itself, broken. Again, remember that Christ told his followers to turn the other cheek to evil. That is, to neither strike back nor back down from evil. In his crucifixion, Christ practiced what he preached. Christ did not call down armies of angels to rescue him or to punish his persecutors. Instead, he forgave his tormentors and redeemed one of the criminals who was crucified with him. In this way, Christ's death broke the power of sin over us. You see, sin reproduces itself in the world by causing others to either fight back or flee confrontations. The only way to break the power of sin in human relationships then is to not fuel it. That is to neither strike back nor cower before it. Christ's non-violent response to religious persecution broke the power of sin that sought to divert him by tempting him to either strike back or flee. Instead of being diverted from his role as the good shepherd, however, Christ continued to forgive and not condemn sinners, and Christ continued to seek out and to save the lost. Sin exercised no power over Christ to change course or to keep him from remaining faithful to God. Its power was broken because Christ neither fled from it nor fought back against it. And instead, Christ died to sin 
and lived his whole life to God to the very end. Finally, in addition to revealing the true nature of his kingship and breaking the cycle of sin, Christ's crucifixion makes the highest aspirations of life accessible for the church. The crucifixion, in short, frees the church of Christ from the cycles of vengeance and fear that reproduce sin so that we, too, can pursue the highest aspirations that we proclaim at our weddings and our baptisms and the like. Again, how? Well, once more, remember that the kingship of Christ is made manifest in service. And the authority of Christ breaks the power of sin over us when we follow his lead and turn the other cheek and neither strike back nor cower before sin when it confronts us in our lives in the form of religious persecution. It all comes down to a profound but challenging proposition. The Christian life is not defined by getting your way. It is defined by following the way of Jesus Christ. The Christian life is not defined by making others behave. The Christian life is defined by self-control. And neither is the Christian life defined by withdrawing from the sinful world so that you can remain pure. Instead, the Christian life is defined by remaining connected to the sinful world so that you can do your part to break the cycle of sin by turning the other cheek. Don't you see? This is what Christ did on the cross and what defines his kingship. The challenge the church faces then is to remain calm and connected. When you stay calm in heated situations, you can act on Christ's call to turn the other cheek and resist the temptation to fight back. When you stay connected, you resist the temptation to flee either physically or emotionally and can seek to forgive or be forgiven, as the case may be. Still, it is a challenge to turn the other cheek because the natural human response to conf confrontation of any kind is fight or flight. In any kind of confrontation, your body will automatically send increased blood flow to your hands and your feet in preparation to either strike back or run away. In contrast, there is nothing natural about turning the other cheek. Standing one's ground in a confrontation without resorting to at least verbal violence or some kind of acquiescence is not natural. Such a response must be learned and put into practice through intentional effort. It involves self-control so that your intentions to act on your principles of faith are not overwhelmed by your emotions. Yet Christ freed you from sin so that you could cultivate the ability to turn the other cheek in order to stop the perpetuation of sin in human relationships in the same way that he has healed our relationship with God on the cross. The church of Jesus Christ, then, is what I like to call the faith fitness center where we practice the call of Christ to turn the other cheek, which is truly the art of returning love for hate. In truth, the daily practice of our faith, like the crucifixion of Christ, is not a pretty picture. Yet the glory of Christ's kingship is not clearly seen from on high, but is best seen up close where we can see it in action. Here in the pain and suffering of life, we see the rule of Christ revealed. Whenever the church continues to serve, to forgive, and to seek reconciliation as Christ did from the cross. In this way, Christ truly becomes the Lord of all of our life 
And we become his ambassadors every time we turn the other cheek in the face of broken relationships or religious persecution. Friends, hear the good news and give thanks. Christ the King is the good shepherd who laid down his life for his church. Christ the King did not call on God to save him from the cross or avenge him, but instead turned the other cheek and prayed for God to forgive his persecutors. And Christ the King has freed us to follow his lead and break the cycles that perpetuate sin. Even now, he shows us the way. Let all God's people say,